these things might be easier if it wasn't William Shakespeare writing them down. You know, the language is just not modern language. Who was able to make him stand who stands that he may stand. It sounds <laughs> but like we know what he's up. saying. He's saying the gift of perseverance can only come from God. But this, only uh, God text can make went, us stand. <laughs> yeah, I went through the Department of Redundancy Department before it got to us. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another Root and Tootin' episode of On the Journey. I'm Matt Swaim, along with my colleague Ken Hensley. He's a former Baptist pastor. I used to play in bands and open for your favorite youth group coffee house. <laughs> Check us out at chnetwork.org. Subscribe to our channel and let us know if you have any questions or interests in things that we're discussing. We would love to hear from you uh, as it pertains to our conversations, particularly the one we've been on for about 15 weeks now concerning justification and sola fide. So Ken, last time around, we talked about conversion as an event, justification as an event, and today we're talking about it as a process. Yeah, I, and I want to encourage those listening, those viewing, uh, to go back and check out the entire series. You know, like, like I think you mentioned, we're, we're like 15 deep into this series on sola fide now. And so there's a lot of background. We have no ability to summarize each time where we've come and, and all of that. And what we were doing last week and this week is we're walking through the decree concerning justification from the sixth session of the Council of Trent in 1547. We already spent many, many weeks critiquing the Reformed doctrine of justification by faith alone. And now we're in the process of presenting the Catholic view. Now, Trent, as most of us probably know, was the Counter-Reformation Council that met in Northern Italy between 1545 and 1563 to deal with the issues that were raised by the Protestant movement. There were important moral and clerical reforms that needed to be made, and that were made at the Council of Trent. But the Church also wanted to clarify and state clearly its own doctrinal teaching in response to the teaching of Luther and Calvin, Melanchthon, Bucer, and the other Protestant leaders. And for context, Ken, this takes place about 30 years after Martin Luther posts his 95 Theses in 1517, and it goes on for some 17 years. And in the course of all that, Europe is at war. There are a, a, a bajillion wars breaking out all over Europe. There are new uh, reformers pop, popping up all the time, starting new movements. And so you might say to yourself, why is this a council that lasts 17 years? Well, the church is dealing with a lot and responding to a hundred things at once. Yeah, and it and it wasn't meeting continually for 17 years. It was meeting in sessions. And its discussion of justification came from the sixth session, which is 1547, which is what we're looking at. But you're entirely right. I mean, Christendom is coming unglued at the time when this council is meeting to try and deal with all the issues that were being raised. Now, last week, we worked through the first eight chapters of Trent's decree concerning justification. And we focused on justification as an event. Um, this week, we're going to focus on the remaining chapters of this decree and on justification as a process. And to kind of use the typology of the Exodus, you and I have been talking about the fact that the Exodus story functions as a type in the Old Testament of the New Testament teaching on salvation. And I'll put it like this. If the event of justification that we covered last week beginning with God's reaching out to us with his predisposing, quickening, helping grace, and leading us to baptism where we are regenerated. If we want to view this um, as the event of justification, where a decisive break, Paul tells us in Romans 6, was made with our past, if this can be likened to the events leading up to the Israelites' crossing of the Red Sea, where the decisive break with their past was made, well then, the process of justification should be likened to the Israelites' journey through the desert to their inheritance in the land of promise, which is where we're at today. In, in their case, God gave them everything they needed to make this journey. This is an important point because it's all of grace. God gave them everything they needed 
What the Israelites were called to do was simply trust God and avail themselves of the grace that he gave them and persevere in this to the end. And And as we're going to see, it's the same for you and me. It is. And uh, Ken, I've referred a number of times through the course of this series back to Paul Thigpen's article that's available on chnetwork.org. It's called, Are You Saved? A Catholic Response to a Common Protestant Question. And he uses the analogy of a lifeboat. Say your ship is sinking, somebody picks you up in a lifeboat, at that moment you are saved. But in a sense, you're not completely saved until that lifeboat gets you to the shore. So the same thing happens with the Israelites. They're saved in that moment when after the Passover, they come through the Red Sea, but there's a process by which they have to get to the promised land. Yeah, you can say they're saved at that point because, you know, Pharaoh and his horses and his chariots are all drowned in the water. There's this decisive break that has occurred between the life they have now, free men and women under God, led by the Spirit of God, and the life they had before as slaves. And that's the same with us. Yeah, when you get in the lifeboat, you could say you're saved. And then as you're heading toward the shore, you're being saved. And when you get to the land, you are saved, unless you look back and there's a tsunami chasing you, in which case uh, you're not saved until you climb up the hill and get above the water. But yeah, an event and a process. Okay, now looking at trend, in chapters 9 and 12 of the decree concerning justification, Trent issues a warning, and I'm quoting now, against the vain confidence of heretics. And you know who they're, re- who they're referring to there. But anyway, this is what it says. For as no pious person ought to doubt the mercy of God, the merit of Christ, and the virtue and efficacy of the sacraments, so each one, when he considers himself and his own weakness, may have fear and apprehension concerning his own grace. Since no one can know with a certainty of faith, which cannot be subject to error, that he has obtained, that he has obtained the grace of God. Now, this is written in response to the reformers who were teaching, who had been teaching, that justification is by faith alone, Matt, and that from the moment of faith, you should have perfect certainty that you are saved. And in fact, If you don't have perfect certainty that you're saved, effectively, you are doubting the mercy of God. Effectively, you're denying that Christ's redemption is efficacious. In a sense, you are slapping God in the face. You're saying, that's nice that you died for my sins, but there's some things that I'm going to do to get my name in the ring so when the credits roll, my name is in them. Yeah, and that's the distinction that needs to be made. The council's response really is to make a distinction and to say, while we should certainly have no doubt about the mercy of Christ and no doubt about the efficacy of Christ's redemption, it's another matter. It's another issue to know with certainty that we have become partakers of this redemption. And, and of course, you know, there are a number of New Testament passages to support what the council is saying here. I, well, I'll read a couple. I think immediately of 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, where we read, By this we may be sure that we know him if we keep his commandments. I mean, what is that saying except if we don't keep his commandments, we can't be sure? Or 2.28, quoting, And now little children abide in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink back in shame at his coming. Or chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, where John writes, Little children, let us not live in word or let us not love in word or speech, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. There's so many passages, just one more. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, I'm reminded of this one where Paul writes, I want you to know, brethren, he's writing to the Christians in Corinth, Our fathers were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses and the cloud and the sea. They all had supernatural food. They all had supernatural drink. Remember this. These are the Israelites on the road to to the promised land. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things, Paul says, happened to them as a warning, and they were written down for our instruction. Therefore, let anyone who has the vain confidence that Trent's talking about, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I don't know how anybody reads that verse 
let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. How anybody can read that verse and, and still hold to once saved, always saved, because Paul is very clearly saying, don't just ride on your, don't be like Paps yes. Blue Ribbon riding on that one award that you got 125 years ago, right? You got to stick with it. Yeah. And once saved, always saved. This is an issue that we're going to come to in a few minutes. But just looking at the assurance side, I don't know how anybody can read this and say, as a Christian, I should have perfect certainty that I will never fall. I mean, clearly, assurance that Christ is merciful, assurance that his redemption is efficacious, this is different than assurance that I will be saved by it. <laughs> the, the only assurance you can have is that Jesus is telling the truth about what we need to do. You can have complete and yeah, total assurance yeah. in that. And here's the curious thing. Okay, you know I come from the Reformed tradition. The curious thing is, even the most committed Calvinist knows that he has no absolute assurance of his own salvation. After all, I mean, I can repeat this as though I still know it inside and out. While the Calvinist believes that those who have been justified by faith alone will certainly be saved, the Calvinist also believes that those whom God justifies by faith alone, he also regenerates. And that the evidence of having been born again, the evidence of being regenerated, is that we will live a life of obedience to Christ. And because of this, if you find yourself, as a Calvinist, if you find yourself over time not living a life of obedience to Christ, you begin to wonder. Not whether your salvation could be lost. Again, that's the subject we're going to come to. But you begin to wonder whether you have it. Yeah, whether Martin you were Luther saved in like the first this. place, right? Yeah, if you were just fooling yourself the whole time. Yeah, if, if, if you had what's considered counterfeit faith. Here's how Luther put it, and I'm quoting Luther now. As we have seen, however, righteousness and certainty of salvation, once experienced, lead with inner necessity to works, to new obedience, and to joyfully serving God by serving the neighbor. These works are born of faith. If faith is the actual basis of the work, then the work becomes the basis for knowing that we have faith. There, there's the issue of assurance. Such a basis is needed, Luther continues, because not everyone that claims to be, to be in the faith or that claims to have faith is genuine faith. There is an imagined and counterfeit faith. Okay? And I can't tell you, I've read a lot of Puritan sermons, and I can't tell you how many Puritan sermons, and they were totally Calvinist, Calvinist to the bone, how many Puritan sermons I have read where the preacher began quoting 2 Corinthians 13.5 and challenging, pounding on his hearers, quoting Paul, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test? So this is where Calvinism becomes a horrible, horrible brain game, because think about it. Let's say you're a teenage boy who committed to Christ at age seven in Bible school, and then the teenage hormones hit, and you start, you know, going down all kinds of roads, and, you know, you struggle with sin of any kind, you know, as you're trying to figure out what it's like to live in this adult body that you're in. Are you starting to think to yourself this whole time? oh my gosh, I've been fooling myself from age 7 to 17 thinking I was saved when it's clear from the way that I'm living my life and the things that I'm tempted to do that I am not saved and I was never meant to be saved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if I'm a Calvinist teenager, then I'm thinking to myself, well, I know that salvation can't be lost. I know that those who have been justified by faith alone will certainly be saved. And therefore, maybe all this time I thought I have faith I had faith. I haven't had it. And then it leads to the further mind game. Well, then if I repent now and I come back to faith, how do I know this faith will be the real faith? You know, it, 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 yeah, it's a, it's a tangled web. And in fact, Matt, I remember saying to my congregation one time as I was preaching through this issue of assurance, I remember saying to them, okay, I look like I'm living a Christian life now, but imagine that I fall into some serious sin over time. And imagine that I turn away and imagine that the time comes when I don't even want to call myself a Christian anymore. Okay, imagine that. Some of you are going to say, some of you that are more, more Calvinistic are going to say, see, Ken never really had faith. 
it was counterfeit. And those of you that are more like a Methodist and an Arminian are, are going to say, see, salvation can be lost. Yeah. And that's obviously but, the, the road that I would go down is saying, yes, you can lose your salvation as a good Wesley and Arminian, especially a holiness movement one. I, that's, yeah, how, that's the but, line I would have taken. Yeah. But the point is, whether you're a Calvinist or an Arminian there, there's no assurance, there's no certainty that any particular person has faith and will persevere to the end. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to chapter 10, though. In, in chapter 10 of the, uh, the decree concerning justification, the council makes the point that our justification or our righteousness, you need to understand these words are interchangeable. Our justification, our righteousness is something that can increase. And I'm quoting again from the Council of Trent now. Having therefore thus been justified and made friends of God, advancing from virtue to virtue, they are renewed, as the Apostle says, day by day, that is, mortifying the members of their flesh, putting to death sin in their lives, and presenting them as instruments of righteousness unto sanctification, they, through the observance of the commandments of God and of the Church, faith cooperating with good works, increase in that justification received through the grace of Christ, and are further justified. There's the lifeboat, there's the process kind of issue. Now, I got to tell you too, I, I mean, I still remember it so clearly, this idea of increasing in justification, Matt, I mean, this was an idea that just sounded positively weird to my Protestant ears. And the reason it sounded weird is because I was so used to thinking of justification in purely forensic courtroom kinds of terms. You know, I thought of justification as the legal crediting of Christ's righteousness to my account, a courtroom situation. And so how can one increase in justification when justification is understood in forensic terms? But as soon as I understood, and this is an important point, as soon as I understood that Catholicism often uses the term justification as I used the term sanctification, then this was no longer an issue. Because, of course, I believed that in Christ we are renewed day by day as we grow in grace, as we put sin to death in our lives, as we walk according to the Spirit. Of course, I believed that in this process of being transformed, see, which I put under the umbrella of sanctification, I believe that in this process of being transformed into the image of Christ, of course I believe that we receive more grace as we respond to what we've been given, and that we increase in holiness or increase in righteousness. But I just thought that had nothing to do with justification. And so the language sounded weird to me. Well, that idea of an increase in justification might have sound weird, sounded weird to your uh, Calvinist, forensic-minded, theological perspective. But did it sound weird to you as a married man? The idea that, you know, yes, you have that <laughs> bond, but you increase in that bond as you grow together. It's, it's this, this thing that just continues to happen and grow and, 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 and for deeper and more meaningful reasons than you ever thought imaginable as it continues. And what is the analogy that is used so often, especially in the New Testament, but all, even in the Old Testament? Is it the forensic example that we're given for God's relationship with his people? Or is it the marital example that we're given for God's relationship with his people? No. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. the marital relationship that is always put forth as the model. When the Israelites disobey, they're not he's not like you're bad kids or you're unlawful citizens. He says, You're an unfaithful spouse. Yeah, that's yeah. a great that's a great point to make and a great analogy. Um, because when we were looking in the Old Testament, we saw that, you know, legal imputation was never referenced. It was always, I will change your heart so that you will love me and you will you know, be a walk faithful, in accordance with my commandments. Spouse, it was always right, a yeah. real thing. And yeah, what I'm saying here, though, is that, yeah, when I thought of sanctification as a, as a Protestant, I believed all these things that Trent is saying. I believe that we increase in holiness, that we grow as we, tr as we learn to trust Christ and walk in obedience and put sin to death. And I, I believed all that, but I put that all under the umbrella of sanctification. And so the language sounded weird when Trent was saying we increase in justification until I understood that justification and sanctification are words that are used almost interchangeably at, at times within Catholic theology. Okay? A great illustration. Okay, now um, in chapter 11, 
and we're going to tie all this together at the end if it sounds like a bunch of di disparate ideas. We're just following trend. In chapter 11, we learn that Christians are obligated to keep the commandments of God, and that because of God's grace working within us, we have the ability to keep the commandments of God. I'm quoting now from Trent again. But no one should consider himself exempt from the observance of the commandments. No one should use that rash statement that the observance of the commandments of God is impossible for one that is justified. For God does not command impossibilities, but by commanding, God ad admonishes thee to do what thou canst and to pray for what thou canst not and aids thee that thou mayest be able. And if I could paraphrase this old language, he's simply saying that when God commands us to obey his commandments, he's admonishing us to do what we can. He's admonishing us to pray for what we can't do or we have a hard time doing. And he's reminding us that he will aid us along the way so that we will be able to do it. There's a great quote from St. Elizabeth Ann Seton that kind of illustrates uh, her, a prayer of hers in this regard. She says, uh, O Lord, forgive what I have been, correct what I uh, mm. am, and direct what I shall be. And that's kind of it, right? Uh, that, exactly. The idea that why would you even ask if you didn't think God was capable of transforming you and giving you the grace to do the things that he's as actually asking of you? Yes, and and when the reading between the lines, and you don't even need to read it between the lines, but, but, but the council is responding to the Protestant teachers, right? And one of the things the Protestant teachers were saying is that when God commands us to keep his commandments, he's, he's, he's commanding us to perfectly keep them. And we can't do that, so forget that route. We can't do it perfectly, so forget that route. And it's making the point that the council and that God isn't talking about perfection. The council is not talking about perfection when it says that we are obligated as Christians to keep the commandments of God and that God gives us the ability. In fact, the council is not saying anything other than what you and I saw the Old Testament prophets to be saying when they looked forward to the new covenant. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. When Moses said this, Moses wasn't saying, hey, God's going to circumcise your heart and you will be perfectly holy in, in, in thought, word, and deed from that moment on. He's, he's not saying that. He's speaking about something else. And Ezekiel said the same thing when he said, I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit within you. I'll remove your heart of stone. I'll put my spirit within you and lead you, cause you to follow in my decrees. He's not saying perfection, although we will have perfection when it's all through, when we reach the shore. He's not saying that. And that's not what the council is saying. The council is saying, though, that God commands us to keep his commandments. Sounds repetitive and that God gives us the ability to keep them. Yeah, it's a great a great little line, you know, to do what you can, pray for what you can't, and, uh, you know, ask for God to do what his, he needs to do to get you from point A to point B, and you do what you can in the process. This is a cooperation. Again, this is not... Forensic justification is maybe one way of looking at it, but I see relationship. I see fatherhood. As such a better analogy, I see a, a spousal understanding as such a better way of explaining what this looks like. Yeah, and it, it, you know, it's the I'm so tempted so often to go off on long tangents, and I'll, I'll make it a short tangent. But but the whole forensic thing, the whole legal thing, the whole courtroom thing, it it, it gets you tangled up in this way of thinking where where it, it it just goes like this, Matt. It says, "Look, God is perfectly holy." So if you're going to obey the commandments in order to please God, you have to obey them perfectly. You can't obey them perfectly, so it's as though you obey them not at all. And that's why you need perfect righteousness legally credited to your account. Now, see, Catholicism just doesn't look at it that way at all. You know, God is God, it is true that God is perfectly holy, and it's true that God is commanding holiness, and it's true that we will be perfectly holy when we're in heaven. But that doesn't mean that God isn't working with us here to forgive our failures, to give us his grace, to give us his aid to walk in obedience to him and help and help us to pursue. It's a whole different thing. It's a relationship, as you're saying. 
And, um, and in fact, next week, what we're going to talk about is justification as adoption, justification as sonship, as divine sonship, and we'll be focused entirely on that. Okay, let's move to chapter 13, because I realize that we're going to go long if we don't. In chapter 13, the council expands on this idea, affirming that our ability as Christians to, per- to persevere in faith and obedience to the end is as well a gift of God's grace. So God gives us the grace to obey him. Now we're reading God gives us the grace to persevere in faith and obedience to the end. Quoting from Trent, with regard to the gift of perseverance, notice they call it a gift, it cannot be obtained from anyone except from him who is able to make him stand who stands, that he may stand perseveringly and to raise him who falls. Okay, it might be you know, these things might be easier if it wasn't William Shakespeare writing them down. You know, the language is just not modern language. Who is able to make him stand who stands that he may stand. It sounds <laughs> but like we know what he's saying. Up. He's saying the gift of perseverance can only come from God. But this, only uh, God text can make went, us stand. <laughs> yeah, I went through the Department of Redundancy Department before I got to us. So <laughs> Yes. And it, it's only God that can raise us up when we fall. So God gives us the grace to trust and obey. And now we read that God gives us the grace to persevere to the end. It's all God's grace. Okay, now moving forward in chapters 14 and 15, the council steps aside to deal with the issue of those who fall from grace and how they are restored to grace. And this is the issue that you brought up a little while ago, and I said, okay, let me state it here. We're going to devote an entire episode two weeks from now to this question of can someone can salvation be lost? But we're giving it just a touch here to to bring out the context of Trent. Within Protestantism, I must say, there are those that believe that a Christian can fall from grace. Like me, that's what I grew up believing as a Methodist, Arminian holiness tradition, Nazarene, right? all of it. Yeah. Okay. And there are those who believe that a Christian cannot lose one's salvation, and many of those who believe that a Christian cannot lose salvation are not even aware that Luther himself, the very prince, the very king of justification by faith alone, Luther taught that salvation could be lost through unbelief, through the rejection of faith. Okay, but since we do not have enough time today to explore this issue, this hotly debated issue, an issue that really separates Christians very deeply, We don't have the time to explore it and to make the case, biblical, historical case, for the church's teaching on it. And so so what I want to do here is simply describe what Trent says. That's really all we're going to do, and then we're going to come back to it, like I said, two weeks from now on this subject. And, And what Trent teaches us is that grace, that the grace of justification can be lost through what it refers to as mortal sin, and that when mortal sin has been committed, the grace of justification can be regained through the sacrament of penance. Quoting from chapter 14, those who through sin have forfeited the received grace of justification can again be justified when moved by God. They exert themselves to obtain the sacrament of penance, to obtain in the sacrament of penance the recovery by the merits of Christ of the grace lost. For on behalf of those who fall into sins after baptism, Christ Jesus instituted the sacrament of penance when he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whose sins you receive, they are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain, they are retained. And again, I didn't want to attempt to go into a full defense of this very important issue. And so we're just hearing Trent today, and two weeks from now, we'll go into more depth, okay? We're going to come back and do a full episode. But let me just say this, though, just a a touch of an answer. Many Protestants believe that for Catholics, confession is something mechanical. Many Protestants believe this. You know, as long as Matt Swain goes to confession on Friday or Saturday, you know, he can sin like a sailor all week long, and it's just no big deal. And so, I want our Catholic listeners, viewers, readers, as well as Protestants, to hear what Trent goes on to say on this matter, because it's very clear, quoting now again from Trent. Hence, it must be taught 
that the repentance of a Christian after his fall includes not only a determination to avoid sins and a hatred of them or a contrite and humble heart, but also the sacramental confession of those sins, at least in its desire to be made in its season, and sacerdotal absolution, as well as satisfaction by fast, alms, prayers, and other devout exercises of the spiritual life. In other words, according to the church itself, a confession that is merely mechanical is a confession in which sins are not forgiven. Is that clear? That's very clear. As a matter of fact, our Lord says, you know, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord to me, (laughs) you know, right? It's not just a matter of just saying the words and going through the hoops. I mean, you got to do it for real. Yeah, and there are so many people who think that what the Catholic Church teaches on this is that it's me- that it's mechanical. It's like I'm thirsty, I just go to the you know drinking fountain and you know fill up my glass and just drink it. But what it's saying here is that for it to be real, there has to be a firm commitment to not commit the sin again. There has to be a full intention to stop sinning and more. Okay, for it, for it to be real. So, but we'll come back to the issue of. Salvation being lost, salvation being regained, mortal sin, venial sin, confession. We'll we'll come back to that. Finally, in chapter 16, the council teaches us that for those who do persevere, eternal life will be their reward, (laughs) a reward of grace. Quoting, to those who work well unto the end and trust in God, eternal life is to be offered both as a grace mercifully promised to the sons of God through Christ Jesus and as a reward promised by God himself to be faithfully given to their good works and merits. That word merit, I'll tell you what, you're going to make some heads explode when you bring that one in. <laughs> yeah, if you want to watch, that, that's a good, that's a good uh, illustration. If you want to watch heads explode, you know, talk to a Protestant and bring up the word merit. The immediate response is going to be something like, this is exactly why we refer to your system as a damning system of works righteousness. This is why. How can a Christian who knows the grace of God possibly talk about anyone meriting grace or of eternal life being a reward for faithful obedience? Surely what you're teaching here is a damning system of works righteousness. And although I'm giving little previews here, three weeks from now, we're going to devote an entire episode to this. It'll be our final episode on the subject. Here, in in short, is how I answer this objection for myself, how I answered it to myself and how I answer it to others. Because this is a big one, and this is one that, as you said, makes heads explode. First, it's simply a fact that the Bible has no problem using the word reward to describe the blessings that God gives to those who trust him and obey him. This this is important because this is at the heart of it. The Bible has no problem using the word reward. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16, we read about Moses, who, quote, considered abuse suffered for the Christ greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. I, I find that such an interesting passage. It just says flat out, the reason Moses was willing to leave the family of Pharaoh and associate himself with these ragtags leaving Egypt and crossing the Red Sea into the desert for 40 years is because he was looking forward to the reward that would come. Okay, Jesus constantly used the word reward. He spoke of the rewards that God would give to those who were faithful. Quotation. When you give alms, Jesus said, do not, left your let, uh, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will what? Reward you openly. And when you pray, don't pray out on the streets so that everybody knows. Go into your closet and pray, and the God who sees in secret will reward you in secrecy. Remember when Jesus said, I'm quoting again, whoever gives to one of these little ones a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. That all seems pretty cut and dry. And again, bear in mind that when Jesus is saying, uh, especially in Matthew 6, which we always hear on Ash mm-hmm. Wednesday uh, about prayer and fasting and alms gifts, almsgiving, he's not saying, don't pray, don't fast, don't give alms. He's saying, don't do it for the attention. 
right? This right. goes back to our whole question of like, why are you obedient? Are you obedient so that you can, uh, you know, check a box or get some kind of attention for yourself? Or are you obedient because this really means something to you? And uh, if you are obedient for that reason, because it means something, because your heart is right. If you are, then you will be rewarded. Okay. The Bible doesn't run from the word reward. In fact, in, in Colossians 3, 23 and 24, Paul is talking about how husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, slaves, masters should relate to one another. And he concludes by saying this, I'm quoting now from Colossians, whatever your task in life, work heartily as serving the Lord and not men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. And we could go on with other passages, but the point I'm making is, is this. It's simply a fact that Jesus and the apostles had no problem using the word reward. And here's the key. This is all that is meant in Catholic theology by the word merit. That is, what is the quality of an act that merits a reward? <laughs> that, that's all it's talking about. And why isn't this an abomination to, to speak this way? Why doesn't this open the door to a damning system? Because it's all of grace. As the ability to trust and obey is a gift of God's grace, as the ability to persevere is a gift of God's grace, so the reward received is a reward of grace. St. Augustine famously put it like this in his prayer to God, quoting Augustine, in crowning their merits, that is the merits of his people, you crown your own gifts. God, in crowning their merits, you crown your own gifts. And that actually, that line from Augustine is used in the preface for Mass on All Saints Day. Uh, you know, that's such a great mm -hmm. line, right? We were talking about all the saints and celebrating them all together, and we are talking in the, in the Mass, the Eucharistic preface, that the, even their merits are a gift. Yeah, and if we weren't clear on this, if, I mean, if this wasn't crystal clear, Trent puts it like this, Far be it that a Christian should either trust or glory in himself, far be it, and not in the Lord, whose bounty toward all men is so great that he wishes the things that are his gifts to be their merits. And I think about Christmas coming up now. When I pull money out of my pocket and I give my money to my grandchildren so that they can go to the store if someone takes them <laughs> and buy me a gift for Christmas. And then I'll turn around and I will praise them for their generosity, and I may even reward them for giving me such a wonderful gift. This is what it's like with God. And this is what the Catholic Church teaches on this issue of reward, merit, and so forth. This is how C.S. Lewis talked about it as well. You know, if a father gives six pence to his son and the son uses the six pence to go out and buy a present and gives the son or gives the father the present, then the father is six pence none the richer, which is, of course, where the band also got their name from that particular analogy by Lewis, which is exactly what you're saying as a grandpa. It's exactly the same. It's not even hard to understand. It's not hard to understand. Okay, let's tie this together then. In, in conclusion, in our reading of the Council of Trent's teaching on justification, what have we learned about this damning system of works righteousness that we call Catholicism? Well, We've learned that it's God's grace that draws us to Christ. We've learned that it's God's grace that awakens in us faith, love, the desire to repent, hatred of sin. We've learned that it's God's grace that washes us clean in the sacrament of baptism, that gives us new hearts, gives us the Holy Spirit to cause us to, to walk in God's ways. We've learned so far from Trent that it's God's grace that enables us to obey the commandments that it's God's grace that restores us when we fall, that it's God's grace that gives us the ability to persevere in faith and the obedience of faith to the end. And now, finally, we've learned that it's God's grace that rewards us with eternal life and treats our obedience, brought about by grace, as though it were our merit. And this is such a richer picture of, of grace than I had understood, even as a Wesleyan. Uh, doesn't mean that there weren't people who believed this about the nature of grace, but the way that I always heard grace talked about, practically speaking, was it's grace the thing that gets you to heaven instead of hell. Like, it's this operative thing that washes away your sins. I didn't see it the way that the church see, sees it, 
which is the grace is like coming through everything, everywhere you look, everything is God speaking to you and calling you to you and drawing you and telling him something about himself, telling you something about himself. And so that all you have to do is just pay like the tiniest bit of attention and you see God in his beauty reaching out to you, drawing you to mm-hmm. himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I, as you say that, I'm, I'm remembering that as a Protestant, uh, not just me, but Protestants in general would speak of the means of grace. And, but they would say, you know, the means of grace are like prayer. The means of grace are listening to sermons. You know, the means of grace are, you know, various things. But, but we did speak about means of grace. Um, well, in the, in the Catholic view, we're going to see this next week. Grace is nothing less than God's own divine life being charged into us, making us his sons. Um, but, but I don't want to go forward on that. But the point here is this. I just summarized everything we talked about last week when we looked at justification as an event in Trent, and this week where we've looked at justification as a process. And we've seen that from the beginning to the end, it's all grace received through faith. And so I just want to conclude by saying some damning system of works. I'm, I'm, I'm sincerely asking the question, what makes this a damning system of works so far from what we've seen? I mean, is it because we're called to respond to God's grace? I mean, is it because we have to do anything at all? Um, if so, was Jesus illustrating works righteousness when he commanded the blind man to go and wash in the pool of Siloam in order to come up seeing? Was Peter illustrating a damning system of works righteousness when he said to the crowds on that Pentecost, on that first Pentecost, repent and be baptized? I mean, I'm I'm wondering now as I look back, in order for salvation to be by grace alone in the Protestants' estimation, must we be literally as passive as someone who is thrown off a cliff and, and finds himself falling at 32 feet per second per second? Is reading the Bible a work? Ken? Because apparently you have to read the Bible to figure this stuff out. Is that constitute a work? Right? You know, I mean, this you can get into good, some serious head games with this. You're asking a good question. You're asking a good question. But that seems to be the implication, really, on the bottom line, is that it's a damning system of works righteousness unless you are utterly and completely passive. And there is no, uh, there's no assenting with your will to the grace of God. There's no cooperation with the grace of God. There's nothing you have to do, including read your Bible, I guess, or, or pray. But that's a word. Make it that's a an act, right? I mean. Yeah. And so let me just conclude by simply saying that as I read Trent, justification as an event, justification as a process is just one illustration after another of God's grace reaching out to us and our being called as the Israelites were to respond to that grace and make our way to the promised land. And we're going to continue. And can, can you've already hinted at at least three work weeks worth of episodes in the course of this conversation. We're not done yet. Um, and I always like to point that out when we get to the end of one of these, because I know there are people out there who are saying, but you didn't talk about this or you didn't talk about that. And it's just impossible to talk about all of it in the course of like 40 minutes. So go back and watch some of the old episodes. Hold tight. We will get some new episodes that explore this even further. But in the meantime, if you like what you're hearing or if you're confused or curious or at any have any kind of range of emotions about this discussion, then let us know. Let us hear from you. Subscribe, share this with your friends and visit us at CH Network. Dot org and join our online community and uh yeah we'd love to love to connect with you even further ken hensley thank you so much always a pleasure we'll talk to thank you again you, soon man. thanks